Welcome everybody to Reef Fish Identification Part 2. My name is Ana Sangronis and I work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Miami-Dade County. I serve as the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent in Miami-Dade County and I am a retired Florida Department of Environmental Protection Coral Reef Conservation Program employee and I'm really thrilled to be able to partner with FDEP's CORAL program for this Earth Month series. These classes are being offered for free every Tuesday and Thursday night for the rest of the month. So next week, there will be classes on Tuesday the 19th, Thursday the 21st, and then Tuesday the 26th and Thursday the 28th. So since you all made your way to this webinar, I think it's safe to say that you know where to find <laughs> how to sign up and what classes are being offered. So if anyone happens to know that or have that link handy, I invite you to place it in the chat just in case. Great, the webinar is being recorded and you should be receiving a link to the, web to the webinar recording. Everybody who registered should receive that link in the next week or so. So we're gonna dive right into things. And first I'll throw out a little shameless plug, asking you all to follow me on social media. And I'll throw those handles into the chat box. If you like what you see, if you like me, or if you just wanna talk about fish or anything ocean related. The next thing that I wanted to mention is that there are tons of wonderful guides and books out there. And if you're looking for something to get you started in learning about what you're seeing underwater, I definitely think that this series is worthwhile. This is the Human and Deloach series, and they are available through reef.org as well as on Amazon, but they're affordable, they're very useful, and I always have one, if not all three of these on the boat when I'm going out to do field work. So definitely check those out. So the first thing that we're gonna do is a little quiz. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask you all to just try to guess what these four fish species are. So starting up here, if you're able to see my mouse, on the upper left is number one and your choices are A, yellowtail snapper, B, hog snapper, C, hog snout, and D, hog fish. Number two, your choices are spotted parrotfish, B, red band parrotfish. Oh, that says A, but it should be C, stoplight parrotfish, <laughs> or D, rainbow parrotfish. Some wonky formatting. Sorry about that, everybody. Number three here in the lower left, and just give it your best guess. Three, your choices are A, Hootie and the Blowfish, B, a Balloonfish, C, Porcupine Pufferfish, or D, Pufferfish. And lastly, in the lower right, we have A, Yellowtail Snapper, B, Schoolmaster Snapper, C, yellow goatfish, or D, spotted goatfish. So go ahead and give it your very best guess. No pressure whatsoever. And see how you do. I expect that everybody's gonna have different levels of familiarity with fish species. So hopefully even if you know all of these fish here, you might learn a new tip or trick for starting to be able to identify them. So we'll let that go for, I don't know, another few seconds. Just supposed to be fun, just to get us warmed up before we really go in for the fish ID, which the first half of this I taught last week, so that was recorded and should be available to you also. So we're picking up from where we left off last week. All right, thanks everybody. We're gonna keep going now. And I, I have a sneaking suspicion you might see these again, so stay tuned. All right. So to be able to appropriately and correctly identificate, identificate, <laughs> identify fish, 
it helps to have uh, some similar vocabulary that we can use when we're describing the fish. And so some of the most basic terminology refers to which side of the fish that we're talking about. So anything on the dorsal side, that's talking about the top of the fish. The ventral side is the bottom or the underside of the fish. The anterior is the front end of the fish. And the posterior is the rear end of the fish. And that makes a lot of sense, if, especially if you do any sort of working out or bodybuilding. On, at my gym, sometimes I'll do posterior strength, which means I'm working the backs of my legs and my back muscles versus the anterior strength days, which is where I'm working my chest muscles, my biceps, etc. Additionally, all, all bony fish, which is what we're talking about tonight, except for a very few at the end, have characteristics that are the same when we are describing their fins. On top, we have the dorsal fin, which might sound familiar, particularly if you think about dolphins and whales. The pectoral fins, are the fins that are on the side of their bodies. Pelvic fins are underneath the body on that ventral side. Anal fins are underneath the body, down by there, you know what. And lastly, we have their caudal fin or their tail fin. And of course, going back to grade school biology, we have the lateral line, which goes down the center of the body, and that's the main, the fish's main sensory organ. So everything that you're looking at tonight was created from materials by reef.org, reef, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit based out of Key Largo. They have extensive fish identification training. So if you have gotten your appetite wet with what you've learned tonight, you can visit their website and sign up for their fish and ours, which will further your learning and take you more deeply into the different species that we have here. We have about 600 species of fish in the tropical Western Atlantic and on Florida's coral reef. So we're gonna look at a number of terms which we use to describe fish. And the first are bars, which are vertical stripes up and down the body of the fish. Stripes, which are, wait for it, horizontal stripes that usually will run the length of the fish's body. Bands, which are diagonal, diagonally oriented stripes along the fish. Spots, which I mean, I, there's really not more I can say about spots, but taking it up a notch, we have an oscillated spot, which is simply a spot with a line encircling it, so a spot with a circle around it. And where we're working tonight is within reefs group of fishes, and last week we did groups one through five, and today we're gonna to be focusing on six through 12, and you'll see that these identification groups are describing groups of fishes that by particular characteristics, either physical characteristics or ways in which they move or interact with their environment. And within most of these groups, we'll have a couple of different fish families. And it's good to know that, first of all, it's okay if you come out of this knowing one or two species of fish. If that's one or two more than you knew when you walked in, I'm very satisfied. The idea here is to give you some techniques to be able to start narrowing down what you're seeing to at least get to a family because 600 species of fish are quite a lot and I don't think most of the, my colleagues who do fish surveys with me know more than say 200 and it all starts somewhere so you want to at least be able to get to getting to at least the family or the genus group. All right so first we are going to talk about fish that swim with their pectoral fins or have obvious scales. And in this instance, we are gonna be looking at the wrasses, parrotfish, the wrasses and the parrotfish family. First, the parrotfish. This is one of our quintessential, fantastic reef fish that we have here in Florida. And these fish are herbivores. 
And by herbivores, that means that they graze algae and help to keep algae in control on coral reefs. And even though algae is natural, it is part of the reef ecosystem, just like everything else, it needs to exist in a proper quantity. So we don't want way too much algae on the reefs, and that's why these fish, this particular family, are so very important. And if you turn your attention to the fish on the screen, we've got the rainbow parrotfish. And the parrotfish get that common name because they have a modified beak-like mouth which they use to scrape algae off of the reefs. And so you can see it and you can hear it. So it's not quite the same as other fish that you might see swimming around the water minding their business. These are very strong, sharp, beaky mouths. And the rainbow parrotfish is one of my favorite because it's beautiful, as you can see here. It's also the largest species in the tropical Western Atlantic and the Caribbean. And most frequently, you will see these at a pretty large size, usually around one and a half to two feet, but they can grow to up to four feet in length. And I don't know about you, but if I saw any fish that was a mama like this one swimming at me underwater, I'd be slightly concerned. And in this case, with the rainbow parrotfish, what you're really looking for, in addition to this multicolored coloration on the body, is you're looking for these orange fins. They have orange pelvic fins, anal fins, and orange tail or caudal fin. So that's your main giveaway for the rainbow parrotfish because the body coloration can look similar to a couple of other species. And so you're really looking for those orange edged fins. All right. Next up, we have the blue parrotfish. And I mean, can anyone guess why this one got its common name? Not because it's yellow, but because yes, you're right, it is blue. And this one can grow to a similar size as that rainbow parrotfish that we saw a moment ago, but its head is very well defined by this abrupt flattened hump. So its head is much more square shaped and its mouth opening is far smaller than compared to the rainbow parrotfish. Oh, one thing I wanna mention, I'm not sure if any of you were with me last week, but all of the fish that we're looking at tonight and talking about, we're looking at them and discussing them as they are, whoops, in their, I lost my mouse, oh, there it is in their intermediate to terminal phases. So that's what these fish look like when they are fully mature adults. A lot of the tropical fish will change colorations and patterns to a certain degree throughout their various life phases. But for our purposes and to keep things smooth and simple, we're talking about them only as adults. All right, this one is one of my favorites, the midnight parrotfish. Imagine a similar size and shape and beak structure as the rainbow parrotfish, but they are extremely well defined by this gorgeous royal blue and black coloration. They'll often have some various speckling or modeling here, especially on their anterior part of their body, but they're very well defined by this beautiful royal blue to indigo coloration really remarkable, really remarkable fish. It's hard to mistake them for anything else. Oh, what's happening here? Surprise, okay, there we go. Now, here is the stoplight parrotfish. And if you think back to the rainbow parrotfish that we saw just a little bit ago, that body coloration can be quite similar to the rainbow parrotfish. However, the stoplight parrotfish does not have those orange edges on their fins. And what you're looking for, that main defining characteristic of the stoplight parrotfish, in addition to the different colors that are visible on their tail, they have a really bright yellow spot right by their gill cover. 
So right here by their gill, and then these different colors on their tail. So these are very common as well. And this photograph gives you a good example of what this fish can look like throughout its life. So here on the upper right, you have a juvenile, and these will be, say, three inches long. Then you've got the more intermediate fish that you start seeing them more at 10 to 12 inches long. And then you'll have that fully terminal adult, which will be anywhere from a foot and a half to two feet long. All right. Oh, here's another view of that parrotfish with that yellow gill spot right here. All right, the last of our parrot fishes is the red band parrot fish. And this is another incredibly common member of our reef community here in Florida. And it's smaller than the stoplight parrot fish. You'll notice that its tail doesn't have those same trailing ends. I'll put, see if I can get this back. Can you guys see how the ends of the tail fin here trail? They're a little bit more long and dangly. That's a, another difference of the stoplight parrotfish from the other species that we've looked at. This is a much more tapered, traditional emarginate tail here on the red band parrotfish. And it's defined by this red ring around its eye and a red band or stripe, really what you can, I'll let you decide, that connects the edge of its mouth and runs up to its eye. And Reef's memory clue for this is putting the ray bands on the red band. And so for me, when I was first learning the species, that actually helped quite a bit, looking for that red band and looking for the red eye ring. Ray bands on the red band. All right, now we're moving into the wrasses. The blue head wrasse is a number, excuse me, another extremely abundant member of the reef community. This blue head wrasse is very well defined by its streamlined body that looks like it's a like a, a squat cigar or even a hot dog. Some people, you know, some people see things differently. I like saying all of them. And this, what defines the blue head wrasse in addition to its blue head, is that black, white, black pattern, that white vertical bar in the middle of its body. So very, very distinctive, very easy to identify. And its tail fin has those trailing edges that point. So it just looks like it's swimming perfectly streamlined and they're just falling in line with the body. You'll see these in large numbers and they will just continuously move and be buzzing around up right, right along the bottom of the reef. Now the yellowhead wrasse gets its name because it has a yellow head. And that yellow head extends to almost half of its body length. And that distinguishing feature in addition to the yellow head is that dividing bar on the latter half of the body and runs the black line, the stripe that runs all the way back to its tail. It's the same shape as the bluehead wrasse, but these terminal fish in this phase tend to be much a little bit larger. And these will hunt the bottom uh, looking for crustaceans, interestingly enough. So they're always moving, they're always on the run. I, I can identify with that, although not so much crustaceans for me, but I always am looking for food. This is the Creole wrasse, and it's distinguished by this very small mouth, Again, another purple or indigo forebody. And these will often visit cleaning stations where fish and shrimp will pick parasites off of them. So these will, you'll often see them in really large aggregations. There is never just one Creole wrasse, similar to the bluehead wrasse. And they will pick plankton from the water column as well as other small invertebrates, whether they are jellies or other things, but they can't be very big because they have that very specialized adapted mouth. So you will see these fish in large numbers 
hanging out, they're pretty unmistakable due to that coloration. All right, here we have the hogfish, which is sometimes, or at least colloquially referred to as the hog snapper. It is not truly a hog snapper, it is a member of the wrasse family. So that's a, that's a misnomer, that hog snapper. Taxonomically speaking, this is a wrasse. And these can grow up to three feet long. They have, I keep losing my mouse, there it is. They have these very, this set of dorsal fins that stand up very, very tall that come in front of their dorsal fins. And they can also change color based on their habitat. When they're juveniles, they will be in sandy seagrass areas before they move off to the reef. And you'll see that those longer spines can fold downward and they'll often have some sort of spot along their body. But that ability to change color is a really important adaptation for this fish. All right, you all, you've finished our first group, which is fish group six. So we're gonna put up some pictures and I invite you to throw your guesses as to what they are in the chat box. All right. We're gonna go through these a little bit quickly. So just shout your answers out into that box or type them out into that box as to what you think they are. All right, Tanya's coming in, Paula's coming in. Oh, hey, Megan Berg, Aaron, rainbow parrotfish is correct, nice. <laughs> All right, next up, what do we have here? Bluehead wrasse, that is correct. Okay, what's up next? Yes, hogfish, not hog snapper, hogfish. Good job. Man, you guys are way more into this. Last week it was like pulling teeth. All right, now here we go. We got this beautiful royal indigo. Yep, Tanya, Paula, Alina. Man, question mark. This is a Creole wrasse. And that's okay if there are question marks. There's no judgment here. Creole wrasse, good job. All right. Next one. Yellowhead wrasse, that is correct. All right, switching families, I'm changing it up. And if you can't guess the species, I please give me your best guess as to the family. If you're not sure which parrotfish it is, but you know it's a parrotfish, parrotfish will make me very happy. Yes, blue parrotfish. So species or family name is great. Oops. All right, what do we have here? All right, stoplight parrotfish, yes. Great. All right, I think we've got two more in this group before we move on. Yes, red band parrotfish. This one is a little bit more challenging because that beak mouth isn't quite so pronounced as it is on the blue, rainbow, and midnight. Yes, ray band parrotfish, yes indeed. All right, last one, Midnight Parrot. Outstanding, you all. I suspect you've been through this before. Okay, that was fish group six. Now we're moving on to fish group seven. These are the reddish fish, and they get that characterization because their body color is predominantly red. And they have these very dark, large eyes because they are nocturnal feeders. So they need those larger eyes so that way they can suck in as much ambient light as possible. And they are reddish so that they blend into the coral reef community. And as I mentioned, we're talking mostly, we're talking only the, uh, what's it called, squirrelfish family. 
And don't worry, I saw a person just mention I'm typing in the Q&A, that is fine. I think everybody is. I don't know why GoToMeeting doesn't. I think it lets me type in the chat to you, but not you type back in the chat. So it's working. Keep doing what you're doing. Now, first we've got these squirrel fish and it gets its common name because of this very pronounced second dorsal fin. And someone at some point thought that that looked like a squirrel's tail. And I, I sometimes chuckle at some of the choices in the common names. I would like to name a fish personally because, you know, that would be really cool. But I could see it. I could see the squirrel's tail. And their fins will have this yellowish tint to their front dorsal fins. The front dorsal fin will have that yellowish tint to it. And so it's got that reddish gold and be highly reflective. And these fish are often found not so much swimming around on the reef, but hiding out in entrances to holes or crevices. They will hang out and wait for you to go away before they come out. Now we have the long spine squirrel fish which is extremely similar in shape and size to the squirrel fish, all right, with that big dark eye. But instead of having such a pronounced yellowish wash on those front dorsal fins, they're more white. So that's the only real and obvious, sometimes not so obvious visible difference are those white, white tissue on their four dorsal fins. So looking closely, I'm gonna ask you all to put your guesses as to what you think is going on in this picture. Which one do we have? The squirrel fish or the long spine squirrel fish? Regular squirrel fish has the yellow on those four dorsal fins and the long spine, they are more white. Very good, nice you all. All right, next one. Do we have long spine squirrel fish or regular squirrel fish? Yes, regular squirrel fish, nicely done. And here's those yellow wash on that four dorsal fin. These are trickier, these are definitely trickier. All right. You guys are breezing on through this. Okay, now we are getting into a group that I really enjoy, the small elongated bottom dwellers. And these include the families of gobies, blennies, gobies, blennies, and jawfish. And a couple of things that are worth noting is that blennies usually have a curvature associated with their posture and I will give the caveat that if you can see the entirety of the fish, because these are little dudes that like to hang out with their bodies hidden in structure and will sometimes just poke out their head. The gobies will also have two dorsal fins. Oh, excuse me, I'm pointing to the wrong thing. Sorry here, it's right here. Two dorsal fins on the gobies, forgive me. And the gobies really are just pretty simple little characters. They will stay for the most part flat and they'll look up with their heads, but they're not, they don't have a whole lot of character to them, character to them, I don't think. Versus the blennies will perch up on their little bitty pelvic or sometimes even um, pectoral fin, but usually they're pelvic fins, and they'll hold themselves up. And they'll sit, they're the ones who will sit in the holes with only their heads exposed. Super cute. Blennies became my new obsession this past summer. Probably one of the most common or the most recognizable goby is the neon goby. And these are found all over coral reefs. They are found perched on coral, hanging out, and they can be recognized by this neon blue stripe that starts at the front of their body, goes through their eye, and continues all the way the length of their body. And I don't know if it said it earlier, but if it's not obvious, when we say small, I'm talking an inch and a half to two inches are the size of these little creatures. 
And the neon gobies in particular are species that you will often find in cleaning stations, whether they are on barracuda or hogfish or green moray eels. They will go and set up shop, clean the larger, the larger fish, could even be a predator, but in return, then receive protection from that predator. So it's a really interesting behavior to observe if you get the opportunity to do that. Mutually beneficial relationship. All right, now we've got the gold spot goby. Oh, that's what I needed to swap. I'm so sorry. I need to put a better picture in the front because I realized that's why I confused myself. This is a goby, not a blenny. Sorry, guys. Do as I say, not as I do. So here is its flatness. Here are the two dorsal fins. All right. So this gold spot goby, these live in small, loose groups in sandy rubble. So they will live on the bottom, right around the reef. And that's pretty obvious when you look at their coloration because their coloration is an adaptation to blend into their surroundings. And their main distinguishing feature is this dark brown bar that goes through their eye. And they also have these rectangular brownish patches that go from the anterior or their forebody all the way back to their tail. So with the gold spot goby, and there's its gold spot right above its fin, You've got the dark brown bar and these rectangular blotches. All right, here are my blennies. Here are the ones that I really have started to get into. And these also live on the reefs and really take advantage of living in the structure, whether it's a living coral, whether it's some uh, uh, part of structure that was formerly coral that is now serving as a rock structure for them to hang out in and they look like little aliens and for me i don't know how many of you out there have met my dog or seen my dog but this is what i think my dog would look like if he were a fish he's got these giant eyes and a funky little face and it you look at it and it just they're so freaking cute i love them and so this red lip blenny gets its common name because it has red lipstick. Can everybody see the red lipstick? And I'm, I'm saying red lipstick with air quotes. And almost all blennies will have these little antenna on the very front of their face. So that's another clue that you can look for. They'll have a little bit slightly squared, a more squared off head. And if you're local to South Florida, a great place to go look for these is uh, Blue Heron Bridge up in the Riviera Beach area. And I just saw a question come up. Is this photo on the right different? No, this is also a red lip blenny. It is just a different color phase. So in this case, I think this is likely a juvenile, a juvenile phase versus the adult or terminal phases here. And the last of these little cuties are the yellow-headed jawfish. And they get that name because they have a yellow head. And these, these jawfish will live the majority of their lives hanging up and down vertically with their head poking out of a little hole in the rubble in the bottom. And they get that common name of jawfish because they have very large mouths, which they use to actually carry and spit out pieces of rubble or substrate to build their burrows. And something really cool, if you're not familiar with it, is that similar to the way seahorses will receive egg pouches, the male seahorse will receive an egg pouch from a female, the yellow male yellowhead blenny will do the same thing. He will take the eggs into his mouth and carry the eggs to term into his mouth. And there is a ton of really gorgeous macro photography of male yellow-headed jawfish with a mouthful of eggs. So definitely Google that. And what makes it all the more awe-inspiring to me is that, again, these are fish that are maybe two or three inches big. So you really have to be patient, really have to wait for them to come see you. And then to look, some of the photos are even the macro lenses that the photographers are using 
are to the point where you can see the little baby fish, the little baby jawfish in the eggs. Just really phenomenal. All right, time to review fish group eight. So remember, goby, blenny, or jawfish. Give me your best guesses. Blenny, yep, red lip blenny, yes. This was the one that I confused everybody with at the beginning. I will tell you it is not a blenny. <laughs> a gold spot goby, yes. Yep, there's its gold spot. There's that dark bar, and there are the brown rectangles traveling throughout the body. All right. Neon goby, very good. Perfect. All right. Last one. Last one in this group, that is. Yes, it is a jawfish. Yellow headed jawfish, perfect. And you guys are ready to go. All right, we're starting to close it in, everybody. You're doing great. Now we're moving into the odd shaped bottom dwellers. And these, the fish families that we're talking about here, the flounders and scorpion fishes, these are ambush predators, which means they lie in wait and then they spring to action and capture their prey. And they don't have the traditional fish shape as one we might think of what a fish looks like. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is the peacock flounder. And this one is definitely a master of disguise. I circled it, this is a photo I took a number of years ago and this, here it is. So here's it's the front of its body. And then here's its little tail right here on this uh, Parides asteroides coral. So they're great at blending in to these sandy areas and rubbly areas. So they're able to change their coloration and to blend into their environment much like octopi do. And this will eat, despite the fact that it's super duper flat, it will eat and prey on small crustaceans and fishes. And because that first photo was tough to see, I wanted to put in one where you could really see and enjoy that this iridescent peacock flounder terminology came from because it's got these beautiful blue indigo rings and this spot pattern on its body. And fun fact is that even though it looks like it's laying on its stomach, it's actually laying on its side. So don't ask me how that really works, but there's one of its eye, there's the other, and they look like they can move independently of one another. All right, I think someone observed that we had a scorpion fish in the first photo. These are other master of disguises, and not so much because they can change color, but rather because of their biological adaptations. Their body has evolved with all of these colorations, and crusties and grodies that let them blend right in to a very rocky or even algae colored substrate. And so this is where as a snorkeler or a diver, it's very important that you watch where you put your hands or even put your tools or camera down on the bottom because you might disrupt one of these scorpion fish and they won't like it very much. They're a little, little scale, they scare me a little bit. So, and yes, those were oscillated spots. That was a good example. The peacock flounder was an example of oscillated spots. Tanya, great question. And so this is how you'll see this fish 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you disturb it or unless it's feeding, in which case it will move around and you'll see its pectoral fins open and that's where it gets its common name or for these for these spots on its pectoral fins. So yeah, this is their natural coloration. And like I said, it's a perfectly evolved biological adaptation that lets them 
avoid predation and also be effective predators as well. All right. So this is a great example of just how well this fish, you're probably, I hope you're looking at it in a slightly new way now that you're seeing it for the second, the second time tonight. Any guesses as to what we've got here? Aha, they're flooding in. Yes, spotted scorpion fish. So if you're not able to see it, I'm using my mouse to circle its left eye and using my mouse again to circle its right eye. And there's its mouth. All right, and here's our second, second species in this group. Yes, peacock flounder, good job. You guys are able to see there are its eyeballs. And as Tanya pointed out, I would call these oscillated spots. Nice, everybody. All right, we're in the home stretch. We're in the home stretch. Here we go. Group 10, odd shaped swimmers. And these are going to include the trigger fish, file fishes, box fish, goat fish, trumpet fish, and puffers. And these are all very uniquely shaped, and they spend the most of their time swimming. A fun fact when we get there, but I don't want to forget, is that trigger fishes and file fishes are very closely related, and they are members of, and I quote, the leather jacket family, and I say the leather jacket because that's their the nickname given to describe the rough texture of their skin. And on the trigger fish and on the file fish, they each have a single spine on the front of their body, right by their head, which can actually lift up and lock into place like a little, just like a little cowlick that they can use for their own self-defense. First up is not Hootie and the Blowfish, but this is the balloon fish. And out of the puffers we have here, this is probably my favorite because I feel they remind me of a, a really shy toddler who is interested and wants to say hi and look adorable, but then they'll turn around and hide in their parents' legs. And that's a similar behavior to what the balloon fish shows. They like to hide, they'll peek out, and you'll see that their body is covered with these spines, which is simply for their own self-defense. And these are very small. They are, I would say, probably the largest six to eight inches. And their main giveaway of their feature are these beautiful eyes, the yellow iris with the greenish blue tint to them. I do want to mention that there are two families of puffers, although we're only looking at the one today. We're looking, we, there are smooth puffers, which include the shark nose puffer fish, and then the spiny puffers, which the balloon fish is a spiny puffer. And the spines are referring to these uh these spines here and they are able to inflate themselves with water and blow up so they look like a beach ball with a bunch of thorny spikes they're only allowed they're only able to do that a certain number of times in their lifetime so it's just something to keep in mind if you're out on a trip and there's someone on the boat who is agitating one of these fish try to dissuade them from doing that because that individual could potentially be taking away one of this fish's opportunities to defend itself. Here we have the scrawled file fish, which is another one of my favorite fishes. These are long and slender. They tend to be a little less three-dimensional. They look a little bit like you squash them between two panes of glass. And they've got this very delicate uh puckered tapered mouth and they will use that tapered mouth to forage on um octocorals and gorgonians and fire coral and you'll often see them swimming almost a little bit inverted when they do this and they're very well distinguished by their iridescent stripes and dots 
that they have throughout their body. And they can also change and intensify how light and dark they are, similar to other fish that we've talked about. And another one of their distinguishing features is this beautiful broom-like tail. So it's a very graceful fish. It's a little tough to see in this photo, but this is that defensive spine that I mentioned at the beginning that they can raise and lock into place to help defend themselves. Along with the scrawled filefish, the other member that we're looking at of the leather jacket family are the triggerfish. And the triggerfish also have that spine that they can lock up into place. The queen triggerfish is, I think, the prettiest of the triggerfishes that we have here in the tropical Western Atlantic. The other ones are a little less decorative, but they are, in addition to this beautiful indigo-ish royal blue body and fin coloration, there are two very distinct parallel lines that are on their face. And so you can think of this as the queen has put on her makeup, if that helps you remember. They do have a slightly sharpened beak. It's not quite the same as a parrotfish, but they use it. It's a beak, but they use it for a different purpose because they are not herbivores like the parrotfish, but they're carnivores. So they'll use that to crack into urchins and other invertebrates as their food source. Next up is the smooth trunkfish, which is in the boxfish family. And the boxfish family got that name because their skeleton is actually a triangular shaped box of armored plates. And if you, this photo here on the lower left gives you a good idea of that. If you imagine the triangle being one here across the bottom and one up to the top, these little armored plates, and they're really, these are, I love these fish, they're really cute. They tootle around propelling themselves with their tail, and they can use their little puckered mouth to shoot water out and disrupt their prey from the sand. And they can also darken and lighten their body and they can become darker or lighter, especially when they're feeding, they can become almost totally white if they're feeding over sand. And when they are juveniles, this photo on the lower right, I just have to mention, they are these little blips and I would say, imagine a pebble. That's how large this little fish is. And they are the cutest things you could imagine. I, I just love them when they're little babies. All right, this is the yellow goatfish. And if you were to take your hand and use your hand to cover the front half of the body, it could really be mistaken at a quick glance for a yellow tail snapper. There's a lot of very similar characteristics in the yellow fins and this yellow stripe that connects the eye to their tail. But if you take your hand away and look at the anterior or the front of the fish, you'll see this very interestingly modified mouth. Their mouth is located on the bottom of their body. So if you've been paying attention to where the mouths are located, they're great clues as to where these feed, excuse me, where these fish feed. And they'll use their barbels, they'll swim along the bottom and use their barbels or their sensory organs to locate their prey, which is underneath them, and then eat. So really cool. This is the goatfish version of the yellowtail snapper, at least from a visual perspective. And again, with the goatfish, you'll never see just one. They always bring their friends. All right, last one of this particular group is the trumpet fish. And these have three color variations. You'll have a brown, a blue, and a yellow. And these photographs are very representative of the way you'll send them, you'll see them on the reef. They will also spend a great majority of their time hiding inverted because they blend in very well with their habitat. In this example, in the photo on the left, is a gorgonian so they'll hang out like this in gorgonians and sponges and they get that mouth because excuse me they get that name because this front part of their body where their head is looks like a musical 
instrument. It's got that very pronounced flared end. And what's funny is these fish are very slender and very graceful, but when they open that mouth, it becomes as large as a hula hoop, which is really something to see. All right, here comes our review part, everybody. So put your guesses in the chat or the Q&A box. All right, scrawled file fish, very nice. All right, trumpet fish, you got it. This one's a little bit more challenging. Smooth trunk fish, yes. Great job. All right. Balloon fish, yes. So one of the puffers, one of the spiny puffer fish, balloon fish. Great job, everybody. Okay. What do we have here? Queen trigger fish, yes, indeed. All right, now we've got this version of the yellow tail snapper. Yep, it is a goat fish, and it's not a spotted goat fish, it is a jello goat fish. That is correct. Oh, was that all of them? Nice. All right. We're almost done, you all. We're going to talk about two fish, two species in the eel family. These do look like snakes. They'll get that moniker of sea snake, but there are no sea snakes in this part of the world. We're going to be looking at the moray family, which is the most common of the eels that we have here. And here we have the green moray eel. And these are super common. These are great candidates to host feeding stations or excuse me, cleaning stations in the form of the neon gobies that we looked at a while ago. And they're not actually green. They are blue, but they have a lovely coating of yellow mucus, which sounds delightful. And I will say, having worked in an aquarium, I have touched one of these creatures before. It's not mucus that will just come off in your hand. So it's pretty, it's pretty in there. And these fish can grow very, very large and they're pretty distinctive. They have a very thick, beefy body and they do have some scary teeth that you have to be aware of, but they're generally mores that do not have any interest in interacting with you. And they tend to get a bad rep because they always have their mouth open. And so, you know, they have their mouth open, they look intimidating, they look like they're trying to scare you, but what's really happening is that that is the way that they are able to move water and pump water over their gills. It's rare to see them free swimming. Usually you'll see them in hidey holes or crevices, but if they're out free swimming, it's because they're either really trying to get somewhere or they found something that's of great interest to them. Here we've got the spotted moray, which is far smaller and whose body is less heavy than that green moray. And you'll see that it gets that common name because of this very intricate and interconnected pattern of brown and white, or brown splotches on a white background. I mean, or maybe it could go the other way, but much smaller, much lighter in load, if, I, if you may, than the green moray and the green mores their only visible fins are their dorsal fin which runs the length of its body and then the tail fin so when it swims it's getting all of its propulsion from its tail and that one usually it'll swim freely but for the most part that one will hang out and hide out as well all right final review we're in the home stretch what do we have here? Spotted moray, outstanding. And at some point every year, I don't know if it's a holiday, but friends of mine will send me things. And uh, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a moray, a moray, do you get it? 
I always delight in those things. It helps you learn. All right, we're at our last group. And these are not bony fish, but cartilaginous fish. And if that's a new word to you, that's simply referring to what their skeletons are made of. Skeletons of bony fish are made of bone, just like ours are. And the skeletons of sharks and rays are made of cartilage. So we're going to be looking at the nurse shark family and rays. The first one, a very common resident of our reefs is the southern stingray. And you'll see these mostly in shallower water where they will bury themselves in the sand with usually just their eyes sticking out. And they are bottom feeders. So they will feed on inverts and small fishes that they have under their body. And they will propel themselves by their pectoral fins. And it looks very similar to birds flapping their arm, flapping their wings. Now, this is probably one of my all-time favorite marine creatures, the spotted eagle ray. And its prominent feature is this duck-billed pointy front end here. And if you'll notice in comparison to the southern stingray that has slightly rounded wings or pectoral fins, the pectoral fins of the spotted eagle ray are much more triangular in shape. And you can find them in shallow, shallow water, but they will also frequent deeper water. And what makes these really interesting is that they will reach or jump out of the water at the surface, whether it's to avoid predation or they're chasing some sort of prey item. They're absolutely stunning and almost impossible to mistake with anything else. Last up in this group is the nurse shark. And these are characterized by this very low profile body and this blunt, almost squarish head. They look like catfish, but they are sharks. And the nurse shark is very easily identifiable by their barbels, the same type of sensory organ that we saw on the yellow goatfish. And you will see these hanging out in nooks and crannies, resting on the bottom. They generally are not too interested in people, unless, of course, their behavior has been moder modified in some way, shape, or form. And even though they don't have the, uh, a traditional looking mouth and jaw, like we think of when we think of sharks, they actually have an extremely powerful bite potential. So. Not, uh, not an animal I'd want to mess with. All right, we've got our final review here. So let's get your final guesses to what species we are looking at. Nurse shark, <laughs> dog of the sea, yes. All right, next image, a southern stingray, very good. And lastly, spotted eagle ray, perfect. Okay, you all, I have one more piece of business before we get to our final quiz. So before we do that, I wanna thank you all for staying with me on this adventure and put in one more shameless plug for a webinar series that I co-host with my colleagues at Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. It's every second Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. And we just had our April one last night, and we'll have our final one of the spring next month in May. So if you're interested in that, you can again follow my program on social media or send me an email. I'm happy to tell you all about it. So now before we sign off, I'm going to ask you for one more set of guesses as to what you think you are looking at here. So we're just going to do this. Give me your first best guesses, because I actually have to run because I'm teaching another class at seven o'clock. So I want you all to just give me your best guesses, what pops into mind when you see each photo. All right, I'll give another minute and then we'll go over the answers. All right, I'm seeing stuff. Hogfish, someone made up a new species. 
I'm not gonna say what that was. Oh, hey, bro. oh my goodness. Another retired DEP Coral Program fellow person. All right. Okay, and I've got a very needy dog behind me, so I apologize for the squeaks. All right, let's see how you guys all did. All right, number one is a hogfish. Number two is a stoplight parrotfish. Number three is a balloon fish. And number four, a yellow goatfish. So I hope that you all feel like you, you learned some new things and maybe sharpened up some of those identification cues. Like I said, I really appreciate you staying with me here. And we're gonna finish it up with how I like to, and that's with a joke. And so let's see if you all can guess this joke. Why didn't the fish pass their final exams. I like my corny jokes. Apparently they're now called dad jokes. I don't really know what that is. Stressed by current events. That was a good one, Bree. They worked below sea level. Ha 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 ha. Sea level, get it? All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. So again, I ask, I invite you to stay in touch with me and the DEP Coral Program staff will be delivering the, uh, emailing you the link to this recording. And in the meantime, I hope you continue to take these classes. They have some really wonderful opportunities for the remaining two weeks of April. So please stay in touch and happy Earth Month, everybody. Take care.